Uh, really great to be here. Um, just very briefly, uh, I'm a practicing cardiologist. I qualified from Edinburgh Medical School in 2001, and I initially subspecialized in interventional cardiology, in layman's terms, that's uh, keyhole heart surgery. But over the last 10 years, and hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll understand why, I've shifted my focus more to prevention and also to policy changes. So what's worse than ignorance? The illusion of knowledge, okay? It's really important that we understand that because it helps also us explain a lot of the divisions and hostility and problems that are going on in the world right now, especially in relation to health, is that we need to all have a bit more humility when it comes to our understanding around medical science. So let's just remind ourselves what we're here for, really. I mean, ultimately, we all want to optimize our health. And I think the World Health Organization, they don't do everything right, but some things they do right. And one of them is they're getting the definition of health, which is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. But unfortunately, we're not doing very well on a population level when it comes to our health. Um, since 2010 in the UK, life expectancy has stalled. What's worse is that healthy life expectancy is going down. So this is very recent in the BMJ news story showing that in certain parts of the country, it's actually getting worse. On average, it hasn't changed very much in the last two or three years. Um, and this is a huge, huge problem. In fact, the differences at the extremes of people in the UK in healthy life expectancy is now almost 20 years from people from very, very poor backgrounds, for example, versus people who are a bit more affluent. So, of course, a lot of people, a lot of people here know this, that the, the big issue, one of the biggest issues facing healthcare at the moment, facing population health, which is making, you know, increasing the burden of chronic disease is being driven by poor diet. So globally now, according to the Lancet Global Burden of Disease reports, poor diet is responsible for more disease and death than physical inactivity, smoking, and alcohol combined. And the biological, pathobiological mechanisms behind that really are rooted in two processes, which are insulin resistance and chronic inflammation. And certainly, as a cardiologist, I've been involved in trying to shift that paradigm in the understanding of how heart disease develops, and also what we can potentially do to halt heart disease and even, even reverse it if we focus on lifestyle that targets insulin resistance and chronic inflammation. But there are many other uh, chronic diseases now that are rooted in these, whether it's um, dementia, whether it's cancer, uh, you know, there's lots of other conditions also that will probably be improved and certainly prevented if we focus on insulin resistance and chronic inflammation. So let's just start with a case study because I think my, this is one of the most interesting patients I've ever seen, but his story will illustrate um, some very co a little bit of complex information, but also help people understand why we are in such a dire uh, healthcare crisis, but also what can be achieved if you do things right. So Tony Royal was uh, a former um, uh, Virgin Atlantic Inter International Airline pilot. He came to see me in 2016, and his story before he came to see me was that um, you know, he was very active, running marathons, actually not eating a particularly junk, high junk food diet, following the standard guidelines, low fat, high carb diet, but not lots of junk food. But he noticed his weight creeping up. His BMI was 28, his waist circumference was 38 inches. He had a, a cholesterol profile check done as his annual assessment, which was a little bit off, not ideal. Total cholesterol to HDL ratio 5.3. Ideally, he wants it less than four. Um, but he, and he was given a risk of having a heart attack or stroke at that stage of around just over 12%. Unfortunately, um, at the end of 2014, he suffered a heart attack. We call this non-ST elevation at myocardial infarction, and he had a stent done to one of his arteries. So this is a guy that, you know, he's 55, he's running marathons, and he's had a heart attack at 55. And of course, it's life-changing. He can no longer fly anymore because he's an international airline pilot. Luckily, he didn't have the heart attack when he was flying, but it was just after he'd got off a plane when he'd done an international flight from South Africa. Uh, and there were, he also was found that he had a, a narrowing in his left anterior descending artery, which was not considered severe. We normally say more than 70% is severe, so that was left alone. And he was put on the usual cocktail of medications that we put people on when they have heart attacks, which is a combination of really many medications, blood thinners, a beta blocker, a high-dose uh, statin, which is for uh, cholesterol-lowering called atorvastatin. And, um, and that was it, really. He was discharged from hospital. Again, there wasn't really much given in terms of lifestyle advice. Carry on doing the same thing. Low-fat diets, exercise regularly, eat less, move more, that kind of nonsense. Um, and then about a year later, he started to feel um, not very well at all. Um, he, uh, you know, lots of different, uh, what he ultimately 
worked out were side effects from his medication. So he had lack of energy, he had erectile dysfunction, he had stomach upset, his mental acuity was going. Now, Tony, what, what makes Tony quite unique in many ways is because he couldn't fly anymore, he went back to his previous job, which was being a maths and physics teacher for A-level students. So he's very smart when it comes to statistics and mathematics, and I think that was also crucial to what he did next. So he started looking into research around uh, the different drugs that he was taking in terms of their absolute benefits. I'm going to explain that to you shortly. Um, but also figured out that it was likely these symptoms were side effects of the medications he was taking. And then in February uh, 2016, so just a, a few months later, I mean, he'd been feeling miserable for months. He decided he was going to stop his beta blocker drug and, more crucially, the statin, the high-dose statin he was prescribed. And within weeks, having spent mis being fe you know, s uh, felt miserable for so long, he, he, was just, he felt like a new man again. You know, he said, in every respect. And then around the same time, he started looking at some of the work I was doing that he was reading through the press. He started getting some books. Um, there's a, uh, an exercise uh, scientist called Tim Noakes. He read some of his work. And he decided he was going to change his diet dramatically. So he went on a low-carb diet. He got rid of all the ultra-processed junk food, the sugar, the starches. And then he increased his intake of non-starchy veg, oily fish, eggs, full-fat dairy nuts, mixed berries. And without counting calories, automatically, within three months, this chap had basically lost three stones in weight. His waist circumference had come, gone down from 38 inches to 30. His cholesterol had gone up a bit, but his overall cholesterol profile, his total cholesterol to HDL ratio, which is more important, had improved dramatically. It was 5.3 before, now it's 4.4. So what was really interesting is, so now he comes to see me. He comes to see me in my private clinic, and he walks in, and he tells me his story. He said, I followed you for a long time, Dr. Mahotra. Now, I've done all this myself, so this is a heart attack patient with a stent who's now stopped all his medications on his own, right, from empowering himself with the research. It's not something I would advise patients to do, but this is what he did. And he came to see me, and he said, the only thing I'm not sure about is I'm thinking for training to do an Ironman. Is that all right? Am I, is it going to be okay for my heart? So I thought this was fascinating. Now, the good news is it wasn't a lot of damage from his heart attack. So, you know, he, his heart muscle pump function was good. And we had a conversation, which I will go into a little bit later, about how I had this conversation with him and what happened next. So let's just park Tony Rawl for a second. So let's come back to... Um, uh, so the next slide is probably maybe the most important slide you will see in the whole talk. So this is an analytical framework for teaching and practicing medicine. 25 years ago, Professor David Sackett, one of the co-founders or the fathers of the evidence-based medicine movement, he actually published this in the BMJ, and it makes sense, and it's very elegant. So what, do we, what are we trying, all, trying to all achieve? You know, my, 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 my late father always he taught me that the ultimate purpose of knowledge is to reduce human suffering, certainly for doctors. So as a doctor or as a healthcare practitioner, we use our individual clinical expertise, the best available evidence, and last but not least, taking into consideration patient preferences and values for the purposes of improving patient outcomes, relieve suffering, manage risks, treat illness. That is what we do. Now, the problem is, if this best available evidence has been biased or corrupted, or it's low quality, and we're not taking consideration patient values and expectations, we are not going to get ideal patient outcomes, and we can even do harm. So evidence-based medicine, unfortunately, has become an illusion because it has been hijacked by vested interests. And what we have now is a pandemic of misinformed doctors and misinformed and unwittingly harmed patients. Okay? So let's be very precise and scientific about this. Why do we have that? We have that because of biased funding of research, research that's funded because it's likely to be profitable, not beneficial for patients, biased reporting in medical journals, biased patient pamphlets, biased reporting in the media, commercial conflicts of interest, defensive medicine, and last but not least, and this is crucial, medical curricula that fail to teach doctors how to comprehend and communicate health statistics. Okay? Now... The man that I consider, I, I started my first, you know, the first slide of Stephen Hawking quote, the person I consider to be a Stephen Hawking-like figure in medicine, the most cited me medical researcher in the world, Professor John Ioannidis uh, at Stanford, Professor of Medicine and Statistics, he wrote a paper in PLOS One many years ago talking about why most published research findings are false, and one of the things he says is the greater the financial and other in prejudices and interests in a scientific field, the less likely 
the research findings are to be true. Think about that. Beyond this talk, moving forward, it will, there will be a light bulb moment, okay? Something will click in relation to something going on right now in the world. <laughs> right, okay. So what else? <laughs> what else does John I need to say? Well, this is interesting. So he, he wrote this. This is a great paper. You can look it up online. It's free open access. Probably one of the you know, most important, I think, papers in the last few years to read and understand what's going on in terms of the medical misinformation mess. So um, most clinicians are not aware of the low quality research that contributes to overuse of medications, underuse of more set effective and safer either drugs or lifestyle interventions. Um, all of this contributes to avoidable adverse events, waste uh, of healthcare resources, and harm. So why is that? Most, much published research is not reliable. This is John Ioannidis' own analysis. Offers no benefit to patients or is not useful to decision makers. Most healthcare professionals are not aware of this problem. Don't presume that the healthcare professionals know, even I'm talking, and I have interacted with people at the very highest levels of health policy and academics in my, in, you know, my campaigning, and my work of the last 10 years, and you know, there's a lot of people with the illusion of knowledge, not just ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. They also lack the necessary skills to evaluate the reliability and usefulness of medical science, and then patient and families will frequently lack relevant, accurate medical evidence and skill guidance at the time of medical decision making. And this is also, this is absolutely true. I can tell you from my own experience, ignorance of this problem is even at the very highest levels of academic and clinical leadership is profound. It is profound. Okay, so let's just take a step back for a second. We're going to go a bit deeper now because in this talk, I'm really going to get, go a, little, a lot further than I've gone before in terms of the roots of the problem because we have to, you know, there's a, there's a great saying that uh, a treatment based on a faulty causal analysis will lead to the wrong outcome. So let's try and get to the roots of this problem. So we need to understand that the drug industry and medical device companies have a fiduciary obligation to produce profit for their shareholders, not to give you the best treatment, although most of us would like that to be the case. But the real scandals are one, regulators fail to prevent misconduct by industry and that doctors, institutions and medical journals that have responsibility to patients and scientific integrity collude with industry for financial gain. Now, how bad is this problem? It's really, really bad. It's not a peripheral issue. It's front and center of the problems in the healthcare crisis right now. So uh, Peter Gosha, one of the co-founders of the Cochrane Collaboration, he wrote this paper a few years ago, basically explaining that the system encourages good people to do bad things. So if you look at most of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies between 2009 and 2014, they paid $13 billion in fines for illegal marketing of drugs, hiding data of har in, on harms. Um, and, and this all contributes to this, the, the, the situation, the mess that we're in. But the crucial point is that even though they paid all these fines, Ultimately, there were no great sanctions. In many cases, they made more profits from the drugs that they were misleading the population or regulators on than, uh, than actually they did from paying the fines. So it was still profitable. It was a, it, for them, it's a cost of business. And he said we should have tougher sanctions. Nobody got fired in many of these cases. People, people died because of this misleading information, deliberately misleading information, not mistakes, Information that they knew, internal documents revealed, they knew that what they were doing was going to cause harm, but they, knew it was, they thought it was going to be profitable, so it didn't matter. And I'll explain that in a second, why that happens. So, okay, some of you might, here might be thinking, hold on a minute, Dr. Mahotra, but, you know, life-saving drugs, the pharmaceuticals do lots of great things, fine, there's a little bit of this stuff, but ultimately what they do, most of it is good. Absolutely and totally false. Okay, so if you look at this, this is data from France, and it's been replicated everywhere in many other countries in the world. So I'm not cherry picking here. Okay, so you look at drugs between 2002 and 2011, and what they did, they evaluated all the drugs that were approved by regulators to be prescribed on the population. And by the way, one other thing that's really important, um, you know, I mentioned this in other talks before. So it's now established, Peter Gosher, his own analysis suggests that after heart disease and cancer, the third leading cause of death globally is prescribed medications, what your doctor prescribes for you, okay? And the reason is that if you look at the actual analysis of almost a thousand drugs that were approved in France over a 10-year period, okay, more of them caused harm, uh, harm than benefit. So 15.6% more risk of harm than benefit versus a total, you know, about 8% here, if you like, in terms of what was more beneficial. But 
about half of them had no added value, okay? And half of them had no added value. They were basically copies of old drugs. Marcia Angel, the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, the highest impact medical journal in the world, she actually, in a talk, in, and did her own analysis, and she said that the FDA, of 667 drugs that were approved by the FDA, again, in the same time period, 75% were essentially copies of old ones. Think about the waste here. What they're doing is changing a few molecules here and there, and then they're patenting new drugs selling them as if they're a benefit compared to an old one, and actually they're just no benefit, no extra benefit. So that waste, clearly, it, there, is no, you know, there is no doubt the evidence is overwhelming that the overall impact of the pharmaceutical industry on society in the last few decades has been a negative one. There is no question. What else does Marcy Angel say? She says that it is no longer possible to trust much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the highest impact medical journal in the world. She's not alone. Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet, 2015, in uh, an, an editorial he wrote where he, he got some of the top medical scientists in the world, Chatham House Rules, he said in that meeting, um, you know, some of these scientists basically said possibly half of the medical published literature is simply not true. The former editor of the BMJ, Richard Smith, um, basically, you know, he's also written articles where he's attended meetings with lots of academics, and he asked these academics, and these are people from the top institutions in this country, and he asked them, how many of you are aware of a colleague that has fabricated research? And about a third of them put their hand up that they knew that they'd fabricated research, but they'd not done anything about it. They kept quiet. Now, I've been involved in this too much, in promoting a, a campaign called Too Much Medicine um, through my private advocacy work, through my writing. You know, I've, I've managed to, um, you know, galvanize or get medical leadership on board because I honestly think most people want to do the right thing. They just need to understand what's going on, uh, and then we can offer solutions. So, you know, this campaign started, it was a joint campaign with the Medical Royal Colleges, which essentially represents every doctor in the UK and the BMJ. And, um, you know, this paper, again, is published in the BMJ. And you can look it up. But in 2015, actually realizing that this was a major issue, the medical royal colleges said, you know, we need a campaign to reduce the amount of medications people are taking. And one of the other things that we mentioned in the paper is doctors have an ethical responsibility to reduce the waste of clinical resource because in a healthcare system that is with finite resources, one doctor's waste is another patient's delay. So it's not just about the harms from the drugs, but if we're spending a lot of time climbing up the wrong wall, in medicine, that is going to be a problem for our patients. So let's come back to, okay, we've talked about best available clinical evidence, which is not great, you know, enough of the pharmaceutical industry bullshit, pardon my language. Um, and, but I will, I will offer solutions. I'm not just calling out the problem. I'm going to give, up the solution, give you the solution shortly. But what, how well are we doing in terms of patient values and expectations? How well are we doing in terms of informed consent? How well are we doing in, in terms of shared decision making? Okay, but before we go there, one crucial part to inf informed decision making is transparent communication of risk, right? So this is one slide where I need, as uh, Patrick McKeown yesterday talked about, very three critical components for success is focus, attention, and concentration. So just please bear with me on this slide. A bit of mathematics in here, but it is not rocket science. It's very simple. You know, most uh, second year, uh, you know, uh, school students can get this stuff, right? So. There are different ways of presenting a benefit. Relative risk or absolute risk reduction, also known as the NNT. Okay? So if you communicate relative risk to people as opposed to absolute risk, then it can lead lay people and doctors to overestimate the benefit of a medical treatment. For example, according to industry-sponsored randomized control trials, okay, if you uh, treat a patient with a torvastatin, a cholesterol orange drug, who has type 2 diabetes, over a four-year period, the results suggest that is a 48% relative risk reduction in stroke. Now, that sounds quite impressive. Imagine the consultation. Patient comes in, has a conversation with a, with a doctor. Doctor says, if you take this pill every day, you're 48% less likely to have a stroke. Wow. That sounds, sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? What does it actually mean? What does it actually mean? Well, it means, if you look at the data from the trial, you reduce the risk of suffering a stroke from 28 in 1,000, so the placebo group, the, the dummy pill group, okay, 28 of those people had a stroke out of 1,000, uh, versus 15 out of 1,000 in the people that took the statin. So you've reduced it by 13 in 1,000. Another way of explaining that is, so it's 1.3% 
relative risk reduction, okay? So the, the way of explaining that in absolute terms, which is what we should be doing with patients, what we should be saying, and what I do with my patients, say, if you take this drug religiously every day for the next four years, there's a one in 77 chance it will prevent you having a stroke, okay? Now, mismatch framing in medical journals also compounds the issue. If a treatment reduces the risk of developing a disease from 10 to 7 in 1,000, but increases the harm, from seven to 10 in a thousand, the journal will report the benefit in relative risk, but the harm in absolute risks. It's exactly the same. 30% relative risk reduction for benefit, whereas 0.3% in absolute terms. Now, it, there was analysis looking at the Lancet, the BMJ, and JAMA between 2004 and 2006, and a third of all medical journal articles, surprise, surprise, those articles were all drug industry sponsored trials, use mismatch framing, where they present, presented the benefit in relative risk terms and the, and the harm in absolute risk terms. And of course, such asymmetric presentation of data for benefit and harms will bias towards greater benefits and diminishing the importance of the harms. Now, don't just take my word for it. Gerd Gigerenza, who's a di director of health literacy in the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, considered the world leader in health and statistical literacy, in a World Health Organization bulletin in 2009, he said it is an ethical imperative that every doctor and patient understand the difference between absent relative risk to protect patients against unnecessary anxiety and manipulation. In other words, and I would argue, it is unethical for us not to explain to patients in absolute terms any intervention that they're getting so that then they can make an informed choice whether or not to take the pill. I'm not saying take the pill. I'm not saying don't take the pill. Empower patients with that information. That's crucial. So how well are we doing in shared decision making? Well, it's interesting. So there is a you know, Cochrane analysis looking at this. Um, there's limited data, but the data we have suggests that we're not doing very well at all. So, but actually, when you look at shared decision, when you actually implement shared decision making, when you actually use informed consent and trans transparent communication of risk with medical and surgical interventions, then actually overall, there is a big reduction in patients that taking drugs or having procedures or undergoing tests. So that's huge. And by the way, all of you probably know here, this is without us giving patients an alternative about lifestyle interventions, other things that they can do for their lifestyle, whether it's diet, whether it's activity, whether it's knowing about the circadian rhythm, whether it's getting good sleep. This is without that, so it's likely the benefits are gonna be much better, and there was no harm from when they followed these people up, when they'd taken more conservative choices. Ultimately, they didn't actually cause them any detriment, but it reduces um, you know, overuse significantly, which is a huge, a huge bonus when it comes to reducing waste. What are the six essential criteria for so informed decision making? So this is what I always practice in, you know, in my own clinic with patients, and I always think about this with every consultation. So description of the nature of decision, discussion of alternatives, discussions of, risk of risks and benefits in absolute terms, discussion of related uncertainty. So I tell my patients, by the way, always, and I write this in my letter, you know, if I'm talking about a cluster or whatever, I say, well, the uncertainty here is, by the way, that you may have a 1% chance of benefiting from a statin drug if you're low risk of heart disease, but this is likely best case scenario because this, is, this data I'm giving you is from industry-sponsored trials where the data has been kept commercially confidential. What happens in many of these trials is people with side effects are removed from the trial before the trial starts, or they select people and design the trial so they know who's less likely to get side effects. This is another topic to explain all of the different manipulations that go on in drug trials to show benefits of drugs in the best possible light and minimize the harms. So I tell patients this all the time. Assessment of the patient's understanding at the end. Have they understood what I've said? Okay. And then finally, last but not least, really important. If you give a, a patient a treatment or prescribe a diet and it's not what they really want, it's not gonna, they're not going to be compliant and it's not going to get you the best outcomes. So what is a patient's preferences and values? All of us have different preferences and values. So it's really important that we do that. Now, how well are we doing? Not well at all. So when they assess this in an outpatient setting, what they found is that no discussion, looking at several thousand consultations, okay, fulfilled all criteria. Think about that doctors and patients and outpatients. Not a single discussion with one doctor fulfilled all the criteria for shared decision making. So we can do a lot better, okay? We can do a lot better, and a lot of this is because we're not conditioned or we're not trained in that way, and that needs to change. We need more informed consent when it comes to medical practice. Okay, now how well, you know, uh, we, you know, Tony Rawls' case actually shows in some ways what can be achieved when you do this properly. And Sue Bailey, who was the chair of the Medical Royal Colleges, professor of psychiatry, 
uh, myself and, and her published this editorial, you can look this up as well, free access online in the Pharmaceutical Journal, uh, about actually for you, shared decision making should be part of mandatory training for all healthcare professionals. So this is coming from the co-author, arguably at the time the most important doctor in the UK, um, that this will save the NHS billions of pounds and ultimately improve patient outcomes. Now, Tony Royal, Six years later, off all medications, breaking his own records in marathons. He's on, his, he's on a ketogenic diet. You know, fantastic. I mean, a really good sort of poster boy for what can be achieved when you actually use shared decision making with a patient. And he's doing really, really well. And this got press released a few years ago um, and, uh, you know, made the front page of, uh, of the Daily Express and the Mail Online also reported his story. And I like the stitch to pills to beat heart disease. I mean, I got a few angry cardiologists kind of behind the scenes. They weren't very happy, but ultimately, you know, stick to the truth and the evidence, and, uh, you know, it's very difficult for people to, to argue with you. Okay, so let's just take another step back. I'm going a bit deeper now. Um, one of the challenges we have is also busting this myth of what people perceive about modern medicine and how effective it is. So this study looked at educated people, hundreds of educated people, and asked them how much of life expectancy increase from 1850 to now, it's been about a 40-year average uh, life expectancy increase, how much of that 40-year increase in life expectancy was because of modern medicine? And the maj overall majority of people in this survey, who were educated people, thought 80%, 32 years of those 40-year increase in life expectancy was because of modern medicine. Nothing could have been further from the truth. It's been about three and a half to five years. Okay? Most of that has come from you know, the development of coronary care units, acute treatment of heart attacks, um, insulin for type 1 diabetes, treatment of moderate severe high blood pressure. But most of the impact in our life expectancy has actually come from things like safer workplaces, smoke-free buildings, seat belts in cars. You know, it's public health uh, regulation changes, better sanitation. Okay, the, this is actually what's had the biggest impact on in our increase in life expectancy. It's not been modern medicine. I'm not saying modern medicine doesn't have a great role to play, but we have to do a lot better than we're doing at the moment. And people need to understand that ultimately, most of what determines good health does not come out of a medicine bottle. Now, let's go a little bit, let's try and, uh, there's something else, I think, another myth that we need to bust here. So if you look at actually what's going to determine population health, what has the biggest impact, um, it's actually changed, you know, counseling and education is good and we need that, we need to educate people, but it has a much smaller impact than actually our environment. So what influences our behavior? Most people's choices are structured by, um, you know, uh, choices about, by things that are beyond their immediate control. So environmental factors, okay? So if you look at, for example, you know, one of the biggest public health successes in the last few decades has been tobacco control. Education was important, but actually the single biggest intervention to drive down tobacco consumption was taxation of cigarettes. It all is also responsible for half of the decline in heart disease death rates was because of taxation of cigarettes, because you make the default choice, the healthy choice, and we have to think about that when it comes to the food environment as well, because, you know, uh, the, Education essentially is ineffective when the food environment is working against you. One of the analogies I use is ask, it's like asking a child who grows up in a sweet shop to not eat sweets. You look at the hospital food environment, it's atrocious. Okay? I, I started my campaigning 10 years ago about improving the hospital food environment because I thought, actually, we need to start in our own backyard if we're going to combat the obesity epidemic. And it's no surprise that more than half of NHS staff are overweight or obese when 75% of the food purchased and on sale in hospitals is ultra-processed junk food, essentially. So we have to improve the food environment if we're going to combat this. Now, what about socioeconomic factors? We'll come on to that in a second, but the reason why policy changes are really important is because they're more effective because they reach all parts of the population and they're not dependent on sustained individual response. So we talk about personal responsibility script. A lot of this is pushed by industry because they want to shift the blame onto you. It's your responsibility, not us. But to exercise personal responsibility, you need to have the right information. We know that's been corrupted by big food and bad pharma. Okay? You need to have the right information, knowledge. You have to have choice. You have to have access. And you have to, it has to be affordable. For many people, it is not affordable. It was very hard. It's certainly harder to afford a healthy diet. So we have to think about those policy changes that are going to allow people to lead the best possible lives they can lead when it comes to their health. So what about the socioeconomic factors issue? So this is something that keeps coming up. A lot of people don't understand this, and I want to try and explain what the biological mechanism is here, because socioeconomic factors are actually the most important 
when it comes to population health. But what does that actually mean? Well, it's a biopsychosocial model. Now, we've had a lot of really excellent talks I've been listening to over the last few days, uh, last couple of days at this conference. And ultimately, the one, I think the missing link when it comes to socioeconomic factors is understanding that a lot of this is driven by psychosocial stress. Psychosocial stress is actually a huge driver of mental, uh, you know, mental illness and physical illness. And there's lots of plausible biological mechanisms behind that. Um, Too Toxic to Ignore was published in Nature. One of my colleagues and friends in, in California, it was a co-author, um, uh, Alyssa Eppel. And what they found is if uh, mothers who were looking after severely disabled children, uh, the, the stress from that aged them by, by about 10 years. So it affects something called telomeres, which are involved in our aging process. Um, when, we see, when I look at it from a cardiovascular disease perspective, there are several different mechanisms involved in how stress, psychosocial stress, increases inflammation, inflammatory markers in the bloodstream, increases clotting factors, or affects clotting factors in the bloodstream. So many of my patients, almost all of them have had heart attacks. Most of them are suffering from quite severe stress and they're not managing it. And just to give you some perspective, chronic psychological stress is equivalent as a risk factor for heart attack as being a regular smoker or having type 2 diabetes or having high blood pressure. And this is something that we're not addressing. And uh, this is something that was published uh, not so long ago showing that a third of premature deaths were linked to social inequality. So what does that mean? Why does social inequality drive death rates? Again, it's a psychosocial stress. And this is a really good book, uh, one of the most interesting books I've ever read. Extensive evidence shows in more unequal societies there's a phenomenon called, called status anxiety. If you have a big gap between the rich and poor, and it affects everybody, rich and poor, where you're more likely to be comparing yourselves to your neighbors, everybody else, and that actually is a stress. So in more egalitarian societies, you find some of the Scandinavian countries, they generally have better health outcomes, and one of the reasons is because they have better, you know, more equal societies, okay? So, uh, another important uh, thing to think about as well when it comes to policies around are people getting, you know, are they being well paid? So if you are in a high demand, low control, low paid job, it is effectively a death sentence because of the psychosocial stress that goes with that. So it's really important for us to think about that. And the problem is in a lot of these big corporations, you've got CEOs that are earning 300 times more than the production worker. You know, and those production workers may have to be doing two jobs, are super stressed out, and then of course, you've got the stress, they then can't afford a healthy diet, you can imagine why it's a complete mess for them. And this is just not right, it's not fair, and we've got good science now to explain that. But Michael Marmot, one of the gurus or the, the pioneers in this movement around public health and social inequality, says a poor quality of stressful job can be more damaging to health than being unemployed. So when you hear these statistics from politicians, we're creating more jobs, that isn't enough. Ask them, what's a, what kind of jobs are you creating? Zero hours contract jobs? Really? You, you happy about that? You proud about that? Okay, so what's at the root of this problem? Even when it comes to psychosocial stress, when it comes to um, exploitation of workers, which is what all these big corporations do. So the commercial determinants of health, the corporations really, are actually driving this industrial epidemic, which affects the, all these risk factors that are gonna cause people to have poor health. So a great um, definition is strategies and approaches adopted by the private sector to promote products and choices that are detrimental to health. Those are the commercial determinants of health. Okay, this is a really important slide. I'm gonna try and whiz through it to try and, and this also, I think, helps explain what's been going on in the last few years. People need to understand this. So there are different ways that big corporations exert their power, okay? So there are different dimensions of power. Um, the, three, the, the, the one here, the three-dimensional, I'll read it for you because at the back you probably won't be able to see that. So power to avert conflict and keep conflict latent, which basically means conflict between the interests of the powerful and those over whom power is exerted. So what they do is they control the narrative and they create divisions in the population. This is a very deliberate corporate strategy. Big tobacco, it all came from big tobacco originally. Well, that, what, another way of paraphrasing that, I'll quote the uh, um, economist Noam Chomsky on this, the general population doesn't know what is happening and they don't even know that they don't know. This is being driven from corporate interests. Okay, 
the political environment. They shape the politicians. I know many politicians. I've got half of, certain, well, I won't name which party in particular, you can probably guess, but on my, you know, I have a WhatsApp interaction with many politicians on various things. There's a, they get lobbied by, you know, uh, by industry, of course, and they're just hearing one side of the story a lot of the time when it comes to policies that they exert, preference shaping. So this can happen through uh, global, you know, corporate foundations and philanthropy. Um, you know, who's a very influential person in the world at the moment when it comes to health policy? Who shouldn't be, in my view? Bill Gates. Do you know that Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is heavily invested stocks in McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and the pharmaceutical industry? Right? So think about that. Um, what else to pre preference shaping? Capture of the media. Most people's opinion on many issues is shaped by the mainstream media. Social media has a role, for sure. But still, most people's opinion on issues is shaped by the media. In the US, 80% of um, the media is owned by about seven, a broadcast media is owned by seven corporations. So people are only getting half of the truth, and a lot of that information they're receiving is to serve the interests of the big corporations. They control the knowledge environment. You know about bias funding of research, medical education, legal environment, limit liability. With all those cases of fraud with those big drug companies, not a single person got fired. No one went to jail, and there was deliberate fraud, fraud determined that, were, that people were involved in all the, these, these problems. They knew about it. In the extra legal environment, opposition fragmentation, deplatforming people who are challenging them, for example. That's what they do. They have all these tactics at their disposal. And what does it do? It drives these macro social determinants of health, risk factors for disease and then population health. So what do we need to do to, to solve this problem? Well, we need to make corporate power a public health priority. Gerard Hastings, who published this paper in the BMJ 10 years ago, he's actually a leader in the movement around tobacco control. And I'm not gonna bore you with all the details on the paper, it's a great paper, but the main conclusion really is that we have to take the lead in a movement away from a world driven by abeyance to the corporate bottom line and the enrichment of an elite to one that prioritizes physical, mental, social, and planetary well-being. Now, you know, it's interesting when th th there's a documentary in a book, and if you, it's free on YouTube, you should watch it. It's very interesting, the history of the corporation. Now, I'm not talking about individuals within corporations. I debated the CEO of AstraZeneca a few years ago, the Cambridge University Union. Uh, he was a very nice guy, very friendly with me. Um, the motion in that particular debate was we need more, this is, think about this, 2018. Their motion was we need more people taking more drugs. So I was opposing that motion, but he was a very friendly guy, very nice. I'm sure he's great with his friends and family, so I'm not attacking him as an individual. And also, by the way, he also sent me a book afterwards. He knows where I live. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, I don't know whether that was good. I should have given my, kind of my, uh, yeah, my clinic address rather than my home address. I don't know what I was thinking. But anyway, he knows where I live. But the problem is the entity that is the corporation actually fulfills criteria for being psychopathic. Okay, so how do, what's a DSM criteria in psychiatry for diagnosing psychopathic behavior? Callous and concern for the feelings of others, incapacity to maintain enduring relationships, reckless disregard for the safety of others, deceitfulness, repeated lying and conning others for profit, incapacity to experience guilt. And, and they, you know, they actually, there is a very good argument to be made that the entity, the legal entity that is the corporation actually functions like a psychopath. Think about that. That's what we're trying to deal with. That, that this corporate tyranny is behaving in a psychopathic manner. Now, I've suffered. Uh, you know, when I started this campaign 10 years ago, my, I never expected my worst nightmare to come true. That the NHS, although I could see what was happening if we didn't sort this problem out at its root, I did not expect us to get to the stage where emergency care was failing. First of all, my mum died a few years ago, um, and she was again a victim of the system. I mean, in the sense that, you know, she was essentially addicted to all processed food. She suffered health problems because of that. But then when she got admi to admitted to hospital, because the NHS was under so much strain, um, they missed a heart attack. Um, for two hours, she was literally drowning in fluid because she went into pulmonary edema, heart failure. My dad, who a, was a, you know, a, a very well-known doctor and his best friend, who's a psychiatrist, was helpless sitting by the bedside. And she suffered unnecessarily, and, and she died. And I wrote about this. It became a front-page story at uh, the Eye newspaper. And then only last July, my dad called me um, on the 26th of July. He said he had chest pain. I told him to call an ambulance because I was worried it was the heart. Some neighbors came over in the meantime. He had a cardiac arrest, they called me. In fact, I called back and, and they answered the phone. They were hysterical. I said, listen, he's had a witness cardiac arrest. Don't worry, I've published on this stuff. I know all about response for cardiac arrests. And if you have a witness cardiac arrest and the ambulance comes within 10 minutes, which it should be doing, the likelihood is you'll be shocked out of it and you'll survive. The ambulance took 30 minutes to come. I was FaceTiming and I, all, I, I, my heart broke when I saw that the monitor attached to my dad when the ambulance came was just a flatline asystole. There was nothing to shock, and he was gone. 
And, you know, it's, it's just, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of stories about ambulance delays are still coming. And this is because we have failed to tackle prevention. And we have failed to fund the NHS properly, properly because the staff, it, you know, there hasn't been the capacity to cope with the demand anymore. And that's what's going on. And, and then it was exposed because actually there was an, they tried to cover up. I mean, I, I got, just to show you the level of this mindset where people aren't speaking up when they should do. I contacted, I won't name this person, somebody I respect, a very prominent cardiologist uh, in the UK. And I said, listen, I'm very emotionally involved in this. I want you to just tell me objectively, do you agree if the ambulance turned up in time, given all I've, that I've told you my dad was survived? And he said, yes. Well, I said, well, this is what's happened. And we need to, and this was the first time, by the way, no one knew about this issue about the ambulance delays. What, a very senior person in NHS England called me and she was crying, a senior nurse. And she said, Asim, we knew the ambulances were not getting to heart attacks and strokes in time across the whole country several weeks ago. My own husband played football, came back with chest pain. I didn't even call an ambulance. This is one of the senior nurses in NHS England. And she, I took him to the hospital myself, and he survived, and he had a heart. So they withheld this information from the public, and this would have changed his outcome. Okay, we're almost finished, because I know we're getting short on time. So what is real evidence-based medicine? It's not rocket science, it's very simple, okay? So first of all, it's the application of individual clinical expertise, best available evidence, but we need to sort that out because it's been corrupted, of course, by commercial interests, and using patient preferences and values to improve patient outcomes. It makes the ethical care of the patient its top priority. It demands individual evidence in a format that clinicians and patients can understand. That means transparent communication of risk. It's about expert judgment rather than mechanical rule following, and it shares decisions with the patients through meaningful conversations, okay? How do we achieve it? Well, I think enough is enough, guys. Although the pharmaceutical industry can develop drugs, they should have no role in testing their own products and then hiding the data and keeping it commercially confidential. And then we just have to trust the results of their trials. This is unacceptable. You know, we know that they're, well, this has not worked. It's causing harm. All results of trials that involve humans must be made publicly available. The regulators, FDA and the MHRA, do you know that they get most of their funding from the drug industry? The regulators, most of their funding comes from the... That's a huge conflict of interest. That's not acceptable. That needs to stop. And of course, independent researchers need to shape the production synthesis and dissemination of high quality uh, and public health evidence. Medical, medical education should not be funded or sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry. I have now stopped going to cardiology conferences where I know the sponsors are drug industry, because I know I'm not going to get the truth. I'm sorry. I'm, just, I'm saying that now. I do not go anymore. You know, I, 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 I'm able to critically appraise the evidence in the best way I can, and I, I link with other people to try and figure out NNTs and everything else, and I give the, you know, but it's, it's a problem. It's a major problem. And of course, patience, okay? All of us, it's on all of us, this. We must demand better evidence, better presented, and better explained and applied in a more personalized way. Now, how do we change this? How do we resolve this, this problem, okay? This is a really interesting uh, approach structure used in Thailand. The triangle that moves the mountain. We have to move a mountain. We can do it, but we need to know how. So, it's about a social movement. It's about creating knowledge as well. It has to be clear, concrete, evidence-based knowledge, but we need political involvement because ultimately it's the politicians that decide and have the power to change laws that are responsible for protecting you from the manipulations and excesses of the industry. And in my own, you know, over the last 10 years, I mean, the point I'm making here is that don't underestimate the power of the truth and the power of your speech. And I was just a jobbing doctor before I started this movement. I started writing, and over the years, I, through various, you know, uh, ways I've managed to become influential to some degree where I have access to people, the decision makers. But the, the, the point I'm making is each of us has that capacity to do a lot better than we, we are maybe doing at the moment just by making sure we stick to ethics and be truthful. We need a bit more courage, okay? And the way to achieve that, um, Simon Chapman was... Um, was uh, one of the key figures in the tobacco control movement in Australia, and he gives some pointers on how you get there uh, in terms of changing policy and public health policy. And in, in his career, and he was very successful, he said, media attention on a public health issue is more effective than private advocacy in witnessing, winning policy change. Sunlight is a very potent disinfectant for malodorous health policy, okay? Mainstream media, I know it's not easy, but mainstream media is where you're going to have the biggest impact. It must be evidence-based. It must be clear and concrete. Speak out publicly. Study the media and be able to speak out at all times. Use killer attention grabbing facts. Place them in the context of a value system. Care about what you're advocating for. Use real people to illustrate your message. Think of Tony Royal. It's very powerful. Real stories, real people. 
that resonates with people. We like stories, okay? This is, you know, you can use complex information and, and turn it into something simpler with a story and use social media and grow rhinoceros hide because, and I've experienced this, okay, lots of times, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, and some of you probably know this already, Unless you're an advocate for an utterly uncontroversial policy, as soon as your work threatens an industry or an ideological cabal, you will be attacked, sometimes unrelentingly and viciously. And Simon Chapman himself, through his career in 30 years, you know, university complaints. I've had so many behind the scenes, people trying to revoke my medical license, front page of newspapers saying I'm spreading dangerous misinformation. But you've got to grow an ostracide and be patient because change will happen. Stick to your truth. It's really powerful. And even during the COVID pandemic, I knew there was a link between obesity, poor metabolic health, and adverse health outcomes. And I got contacted by Matt Hancock to advise him. I told him that actually there's a huge lack of awareness amongst the public and scientific community about the role of poor metabolic health playing in the pandemic. And it's likely to most significant factor also driving poor outcomes in people from ethnic minorities because we are a bit more vulnerable. Um, and I told him, I said, I said, Matt, these are the policy changes. You need to focus on ultra-processed food and you take on the industry. He knows it. Matt knows it. But this is much even bigger than Matt Hancock. Um, I mean, I know he lost two stone when he followed my advice. My, he, he read my book. I gave him my diet, first diet book and he lost two stones on that. But, you know, policy change is different. It's a much bigger monster that we're dealing with. And then, I became, I'm just going to briefly talk about this. I know we've short short time, about to finish. Um, I got heavily involved both behind the scenes and publicly around the NHS vaccine mandate. Now, whatever you view on the, max, on the vaccine, we've never mandated anything in this country. It's about encouragement, persuasion, about informed consent. The Medical Royal Colleges and the BMA said that we are not going to support mandates. Almost 100,000 NHS staff were at risk because they refused. And by the way, good on you for digging your heels in. Okay, I was getting contacted by many doctors, nurses behind the scenes who were in tears. They were saying, Asim, what are we going to do? And I both, I had indirect access to Sajid Javid, and every opportunity I got, whether it was BBC, Sky News, LBC, or GB News, I kept saying three key points. This is unethical, okay? It's about personal autonomy. It is unscientific. Whatever the vaccine benefit is there or not there, it does not stop transmission. You're not protecting anybody else by having the vaccine. It is unethical and it is impractical, okay? And is it, it is impractical because we were gonna lose NHS staff and I'm glad those people dug their heels in. And I knew, I just knew, I had faith this was gonna get overturned. And this is just somebody, I don't know this person, she was happy for me to share this. On Instagram, she contacted me, she's a cardiac uh, nurse, sonographer, and this is just, she goes a heads up, she was very upset, she was about to lose her job and resign, and this is me replying to her, said this doesn't change, because the House of Lords, this got passed in the House of Lords as well, and said this doesn't change anything, can still be overturned, hanging, hanging in there, I knew it was gonna get overturned, and then we got it overturned. And I was part of this you know, group of doctors and people that were involved in getting this overturned. But for me, what gave me more satisfaction than anything else I've done, whether it's getting a sugary drinks tax, you know, or whether it's busting the myth of, you know, obesity and physical activity or cholesterol and heart disease, for me, the biggest impact was the fact that, you know, I could at least make a contribution to helping save 100,000 NHS jobs because that's how many people <laughs> lost their jobs. And that, you know, so... Right. Where do we go from here? We have to reframe. There are counterattacks. This is an, a great book, really good, like detailed book on the corporation. The expert on this, William Whist in America, has written this, The Public Health of the Bottom Line. You need to know the tactics, what they do, and how we can combat them. But we need to refocus our, our way of thinking. We need to detach ourselves. Funding of research should not come from industry. We need to understand the industry is there just to produce profit. Okay? We need to change the way industry functions, but it needs changes in the law. And we need to think more about ethics and spirituality as well. You know, we need to be able to lead by example to our children that the value of personal success doesn't come from material gain and consumerism and earning lots of money. There are more important things in life. Robert Kennedy, I love this quote, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except what makes life worthwhile. And of course, you know, going back to ancient wisdom, 
Plato, a disciple of Socrates. These are the four cardinal virtues to lead the good and happy life. And I've become convinced by that, actually, that you, you need to live a virtuous life also to be happy. And these, you know, wisdom, courage, moderation means don't, don't get overly attached to anything. But so ultimately, you know, if you get overly attached to things, things change, nothing is permanent. You're going to suffer loss at some point. Your suffering will be less. And then justice. But of all of those virtues, the most important is courage. Because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. So we have to be more courageous. If, you know, if we're not part of the solution, we are part of the problem, and there will be no solution. And Abraham Lincoln predicted this, the growing invisible power of the corporations. We're now at, a, I think, a tipping point. The bubble needs to burst. We're going, we're regressing, we're not progressing. And he says, I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. Corporations have been enthroned and an era of corruption in high places will follow and the money power of the country, and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. So it's time to rise up, okay? Let's rise up against this organization of mis misery. Knowledge without action is vanity. Action without knowledge is insanity. Wisdom without courage is fruitless. And to finish on a quote from one of my inspirations, Mahatma Gandhi, it is health that is the real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Thank you very much.